So I'm Eva Harris, and I'm a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, and I work on dengue and Zika viruses, both at Berkeley in my laboratory and in Nicaragua through decades of collaboration. And what I'm gonna be talking about today is the migration of dengue and Zika, and I'm gonna break it down on three different levels. So we're gonna be talking about migration um, across continents and then around cities and then within the human host. I'm gonna make a link as well with migration and evolution because it is, after all, the Darwin series. Uh, and we'll talk about evolution as a migration of mutations across time and space. And so that's gonna be kind of the dual themes as we discuss this topic today. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of uh, Darwin College and the master who is, uh, sends her good wishes from New Zealand, um, I, would, uh, I would like to wish you a very good evening and welcome to the fifth lecture in the uh, 2018 Darwin Lecture Series on the theme of migration. The first of our four lectures have examined different facets of migration and humanity in, the social, in, in this social and political framework in which uh, that migration takes place. This week we stay with pe people uh, and address issues at least as germane, but relate not, uh, we go one step up the food chain to the species that migrate with us and within us and feed uh, on us uh, with profound impacts on our health and well-being. Professor Eva Harris has worked for three decades with some of the most critical infectious diseases as they impact on the communities of Latin America in particular. Alongside her pioneering research on dengue, Zika, and chikung uh, chikungunya, she has created and nurtured a highly successful nonprofit humanitarian organization, the Sustainable Sciences Institute, committed to building local capacity for public health research. For such work, she received the prestigious MacArthur Award. She moreover has received national recognition award from the Minister of Health of Ni Nicaragua for her contribution to scientific development and has been selected as a global leader for tomorrow by the World Economic Forum. It gives me great pleasure to invite Professor Eva Harris to give the Darwin Lecture on Disease and Migration. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and thank you for the invitation. It's really a, very much of an honor and a privilege and a pleasure to be here. So what I'm gonna do today is uh, discuss my work from a very different angle than I usually think about it. And I'm gonna tell you a story about disease migration and I decided to focus it um, on migration of dengue and Zika viruses, but we're gonna talk about it on three different levels, um, across continents, around cities, and then actually within the human host. And um, what I'm gonna do is start with an introduction to dengue and Zika. Um, and then we're gonna discuss uh, essentially go what I do and then I'm gonna try and wrap what I do around this topic. So it's kind of like a backwards gymnastics for me, but um, we're gonna see how it works. And you're the, you're the guinea pigs. So um, dengue is a really huge public health problem worldwide. Um, there's about three billion people at risk of infection, and it's infection with a virus, uh, and it's transmitted by this mosquito um, of the Aedes uh, genus, and it's the Aedes aegypti, and it's called Aedes albopictus. And if you've ever been in the tropics and have swatted yourself and found a little white stripes on the legs, then you've probably been infected. So you will remember this lecture. Um, and there's about 100 million um, cases per year, 400 million infections. It's a really huge public health problem. Um, and it's one of the big issues that's been un essentially spreading uncontrollably around the world um, on three different levels. We have the, the increase in the numbers of cases, as you can see, increase in geographic dissemination. Um, this is an example of, of dengue hemorrhagic fever in the Americas, same thing in Asia. Africa, and as, w as well as um, in India. Um, and we have four different flavors of this virus called dengue one, two, three, and four, not very imaginatively. Um, but one of the really curious things about this disease is that, first of all, looking at its, um, my, this is 
from preliminary to my migration idea, but um, dengue in, in 1975 or so was, was around different places in the world, but not as much as now, where it's all four stereotypes are everywhere. And the kicker to this is that the greatest risk factor for severe disease is actually a previous infection with a different flavor or a different stereotype. And so this causes, and it's thought to be an immunopathogenesis as well as viral pathogenesis. So it's really quite a complicated disease. Now, the clinical manifestations are an acute onset, very high fever, um, very unpleasant. It's called la quebradora, or breakbone fever, and I've had it. But I've survived because I had it the first time. Um, the second time, you have this potential um, increased vascular permeability, which leads to sh essentially leakage, internal leakage, and leads to shock, and can be fatal in healthy people within 24 to 48 hours. So it's a very frightening disease for a population because you don't know who of those 400 million infections, even though there's only a small number, you don't know who those numbers are gonna be. And so it's very frightening and it's often in pediatric populations. Um, and so um, this is a problem. So who is the culprit? This is, this is dengue, it's a variant, it's a little virus, it's a little round ball, but um, I actually started off working on parasites and they have tails, they're really cool. But I was very disappointed by viruses which are little round balls. But it's okay because they're actually not as uh, boring as this looks because they really, now that we understand, they breathe and they have internal aspects that open different parts of them to your antibody response. So they're actually more interesting, but nonetheless, this is, and it's covered with this envelope protein, which is an anti-parallel dimers across the entire virion surface. Um, but inside of it is an RNA genome. So this genome is not what you think of as your usual DNA, but it's rather the RNA, um, which is actually very important because because it, uh, DNA is double-stranded and RNA is single-stranded, you actually can have a higher mutation rate in an RNA virus because you don't have a template that it has to match with all the time. And so that's why we have higher mutation rates, and, and you'll see, I'm gonna talk about this in a moment. So what we can do is we can sequence, it's only 10,700 nucleotides long, so it's really quite little. Um, our genome is billions of, of base pairs. And what we, we can see here, this is essentially a way of, um, we sequence and then we compare the genomic sequence and then because of that we can look at genetic distance between different viruses or between different organisms. And so what we measure along here, what these branches are, is the genetic distance between the guys at the end. So these are, you can consider them siblings, um, and this you can consider a cousin. And these would be the cousin far, you know, second removed over here. And so the dengue are very close together, but the one right closest to it is Zika. And that was very um, difficult because the closer you are genetically, the closer you are antigenetically, and the more cross-reactivity you have with antibodies that the, the host is gonna make to recognize the pathogen, in this case, the virus. So there's a lot of confusion between dengue and Zika because they're so close. Um, but we're gonna come back to this concept in a moment. And so um, with dengue, the issue is that there's uh, essentially many different aspects to consider. One are individual risk factors for disease, um, age, race, sex, et cetera, nutritional status. But then there's also, because there's all four of these circulating, you have what we call epidemiological risk factors because it's not just about how your population is in relation to that one virus, but rather you have to take into account the population immunity to all four of these viruses. And so it's actually really like complicated and we have risk factors that are more than just the individual, but rather at the population level, which we call epidemiological risk factors. And then there's also viral risk factors, um, which are not only at the level of the, of the serotype, the one, two, three, four, but it's like Russian dolls because within each of those four serotypes, there are genotypes. And within each genotype, there are clades. And within each clade, there are strains. And you can actually have differences that have to do with disease severity at the level, for instance, of the strain or the clade. So it's quite complicated. Um, and we've also discovered a new a viral protein that actually has a direct role in causing vascular leak. So there's, it's quite complicated. Then we have our cousin Zika, which bursts on the scene um, and actually was discovered initially in, in Uganda, but um, actually in monkeys. As it was just kind of a, a surveillance project. Um, and the first human cases were only discovered about 10 years later, um, but never really caused very severe disease. And so we only know about it by the imprint that it leaves on a human, which is the antibody response. Um, and so it was in various different places in Africa, but never associated with, with severe disease. Um, and so then we have this sudden explosion of what happened was that it left Africa, um, and then in 2007, uh, caused a, an outbreak in this island called Yap, 
which is now famous because that's where Zika started to raise its ugly head. Um, it then moved into French Polynesia in 2013 for another much bigger epidemic of about 100,000 people. Um, and then when we really know about it is when it moved into Brazil and from there throughout Latin America. And so what we're going to talk about um, is the, the, both the migration of the disease, the virus, but then also the impact in terms of disease because really no one was paying attention to it because it causes a very mild disease just upon regular infection. And no one was expecting what happened, which was that when a pregnant woman is, is infected, it leads to these really terrible congenital um, de defects, including microcephaly. Um, and so microcephaly is this rare neurological disorder, um, which in the case of Zika is because of the in, essentially the ability to, to migrate through the placenta, which I'll show you some of our work on this, and then into the neural progenital cells and then cause these terrible defects. And so that's, there's so many questions that this has risen, uh, uh, and we'll discuss that in a moment. So, and now that I've told you a little bit about dengue and Zika, what is common to both of them is the mosquito, because nothing happens without the mosquito transmission. Um, Zika can also be transmitted sexually, um, but we consider that kind of secondary to the mosquito transmission, but that's another surprise that happened with Zika. But the mosquito problem is you have this huge worldwide distribution of this 80s Egypti mosquito, and if you look here, you know, everyone's freaked out about shark attacks. Okay, look at the number of shark attacks, even humans, which we know are bad for humans, um, but compared to mosquitoes, mosquitoes are really bad for humans. Um, and so there's a huge numbers of deaths associated with various different mosquito-borne illnesses. Um, and with, with, in terms of um, the mosquito that transmits both dengue and Zika, and it turns out chikungunya, which we might have heard of, is because of the, the mosquito itself. And I'm gonna talk about dengue emergence, but really, I mean, this slide was made for me maybe five years ago, and now it's totally out of date because of these other emerging viruses which have happened upon the scene. But the issue is really global trade, because what global trade does is that in these ships, um, it moves the mosquito around. And this is a really interesting story, because actually, um, the Aedes albopictus, which is that secondary vector, is all over the United States. And it was traced back to a single point introduction when a ship from Southeast Asia docked in New Orleans with tires used tires, and inside the used tires there was water, and inside the water there were larvae of these mosquitoes, and that single introduction spread the larvae that became mosquitoes throughout the entire United States, and that's how the mosquito gets around. And then you have global travel, and as you know, the hot zone and all this, it's actually true, you can just get infected, not know it, get on a plane, get off a plane, and start an epidemic somewhere, and that is how these viruses move. Um, but you need to go somewhere where the mosquito is. And so you get virus plus mosquito is disaster. Um, but the problem also is compounded with urbanization because what happens with unplanned urbanization in tropical areas is that you have a lot of um, essentially intermittent water or no water supplies. So then people have barrels or places to keep their water. And since this, wa this mosquito breeds in clean water, that's where the mosquito likes to be, around your house. Um, but also, when you don't have good waste management, you've got garbage that's around, and like a little Coke like pan lid or you know, a shoe or an old plastic container are perfect for catching rainwater, and that's where they breed also. So essentially, the problem is that the dengue and the chikungunya and the Zika mosquito are perfectly adapted to the human ecology in the 21st century, and that's why we have such a big problem with it. So with all these problems, when I started working on dengue, um, I migrated actually to dengue from parasitic diseases because it was such a big public health problem. And I, for a part of my life, uh, really spent time developing this nonprofit organization um, for just teaching scientific capacity in developing countries. I was in, academ in academia and then I kinda caught a little bit of a foot there, but I really felt like I wanted to make a difference in the world. And so, you know, listen and find out what the priority problems were and then build back up from there. Um, and when I asked everyone what are the problems, they all said dengue, and I said, how do you spell that? Because I didn't know anything, and I found out to my shock and horror that it was a virus, and that it had a lot of immunopathology, and I didn't, hadn't studied any of that, but as you will find, you all know, actually, half of you will find out, and half of you already know this, uh, depending on how long you've been associated with the Darwin College, um, is that, you know, you essentially, your science just takes you where it wants to. You know, you, I always feel like you're kind of, is, science is this horse and I'm holding onto the tail and it's going where it wants and I'm learning wherever it takes me. 
because that's what you have to do. You follow your science. And so I had to follow my science. And my, I originally got my PhD in molecular and cell biology and actually yeast genetics way over here on this side of the spectrum. So I thought, OK, I can start studying the molecular virology of this virus. But then I realized that you know this is a virus that causes disease, and I need to see it in the context of an organism. So I started working on pathogenesis and immunology and creating animal models and whatnot. But then you know dengue doesn't really infect mice; it infects humans. So I had to continue all the work that we had started in Nicaragua, which of course is what I love most, um, and built these studies that you'll see, which are now in the 20 years running, 15 years running, the same studies to be able to look at this disease in human populations. And then you don't want to just look at human disease. You want to actually control it. So then we developed a whole series of evidence, essentially community participation based on evidence um, that was able to um, put, essentially dim the risk or diminish the risk for, for dengue and for Zika. And so all of this has been like essentially one big program that learns from the laboratory, translates in the field, and then learns from the field and translates back to the laboratory. While I'm training, people both in the United States and Europe to you know, collaborate overseas and training a cadre, many people in Nicaragua to essentially have a sustainable infrastructure in Nicaragua and other countries, as well as to come to the, my lab and go back and forth. And so it's kind of this, this whole big kind of circular conception, which has a holistic view of what disease is. And I think that that's going to be really important um, in terms of each piece of it is important, but I think it's also important to see science as a much broader essentially interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary endeavor, um, especially infectious diseases that touch on all of these different aspects. Um, and so when, what I think what happens is that when Zika happened, is that the whole program went Zika, essentially, because there wasn't one question about Zika. There were essentially a zillion Zika questions. Um, but since we were kind of poised across the, across the spectrum, we were able to move horizontally directly into Zika along all of these different areas. Um, and what I'm going to tell you about is a piece of evolution, a piece of our placental transmission, a piece of our diagnostics, and a piece of our epidemiology. But I'm going to package that inside the concept of migration. You thought I'd forgotten about it, but I haven't. Um, um, but all of this is actually housed within, the co with, with, within this collaborative structure that I've built after actually over tw 30 years now in very close collaboration with the Ministry of Health of Nicaragua which has hospital studies, a cohort study, which I'll explain to you, which is essentially a, a study of the population, um, and then community participation in mosquito control through cl collaboration with the laboratory, information technologies, and our nonprofit, which also is housed in Nicaragua. And then this also went Zika. So within two months of the Zika epidemic, we actually established about 10 or 15 new studies to look at Zika in various different aspects, and that I'll tell you about. So what I've decided to do here is to look at migration of dengue and Zika, as I said, on these three very different levels, across continents, around cities, and then within the human host. But I've also decided to quote Charles Darwin. Now, I understand that the Darwin College is actually not Charles Darwin, but rather the Darwin family. But nonetheless, I thought it was close enough that I would you know, choose a quote, which essentially is from the, on the origin of species and talks about uh, mutations that can arise. He doesn't call them mutations. but um, Essentially, you know, the, 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 in the course of ages, chance to rise, modifications, he calls it, that favor the individuals by better adapting them, and essentially touches on this concept of natural selection. And what I'm going to show you is both is some functional genetics of how the, the, the virus that causes the current epidemic of Zika has actually changed, and we actually know how it's changed functionally in certain aspects. And so I'm going to start with that concept. But overall, I'm going to take a, a lens of evolution to the concept of migration by redefining, not de redefining, but by defining evolution as a migration of mutations across time and space. And so we're going to kind of touch on that across continents, also looking at adaptation and natural selection as the virus moved across continents. And we're going to talk about cities and adaptation to different hotspots for mosquitoes that transmit the virus. And within the human host, we're going to look at both examples with dengue and Zika about adaptation and fitness um, in different parts of the human body. And so we're going to kind of take it on all these different levels and hope you stay with me and that this is vaguely coherent by the end. So again, my presentation, you've already survived the first part, so congratulations. Um, you've made it through the introduction. Um, and now we're going to take, so I'm going to tell you about across continents by looking at dengue geographic spread at Zika epidemic spread, and then this, this kind of evolution of specific functional genetic mutations. We're going to look at around cities, again, by looking at our own cohort study, our own studies in Nicaragua, and how both dengue, the different serotypes of dengue, and then Zika have spread in our study populations, and then how we've been able to study 
in, in real time the spread of virus and, and of, of Zika and kind of what that, what that implies. And then we're going to move it even more to the human host where we have studies of Zika in the human placenta and literal migration of the virus, but also that kind of conceptual vi migration by means of looking at mutations that, pick, that are picked up in, in, the hum in the virus within the human host. Um, and we're going to get to that at the end. Um, so starting with the first one, this is just a map. Um, essentially, you'll see the spread of dengue. And you'll see that this is not at the serotype level. It's just Pan American Health Organization data um, from the 1960s. And so red is bad. Just remember, red is bad. And you're going to see it spread throughout Latin America over time. And so what you see is that there's more and more red in more and more countries over a very short piece of period of time, just decades. Mm. And this actually cuts off in 2005, and it's m much worse. Um, and so now we're going to look at, the, so that was over a period of decades. And we thought that was bad. Now we see Zika, which is coming in in February 2014, first on, in Chile. So first you're going to see these orange dots. Um, and now in March 2015, we have this now starting in the Americas in Bahia, Brazil. Um, by within three months, we have a third of all Brazilian um, states have reported cases of Zika. Then it starts coming up in Colombia. And, by two, and so also look at this number of countries here. 2015, it's in Central America. Um, Guatemala and Paraguay reports as 40 cases. By December, it's in various islands in the Caribbean and also on the African coast in Cape, in Cape Verde. Um, then by January 2016, it's, it's, we're having imported cases in, in the U.S., in the European Union, Middle East, and Australia. March 2016, where it's like Africa and throughout. You can see it's starting to get more and more and more. The number of countries are increasing. Um, you know, then WHO recommends safe sex and abstinence for eight weeks after visiting a place because now we understand that it's being transmitted um, by sexual contact, by imported cases into places where there is no mosquito transmission. By July 2016, so we now have Guillain-Barre syndrome are reported in 18 countries. Um, local transmission is happening in the United States. By November 2016, now WHO declares WHA no longer to be a public health emergency, but it's still an emergency because we, there's so much we don't understand, and it's pretty much everywhere. Um, now, the epidemic itself has, turned, has gone down, and you'll see why, essentially because so much of the population got infected that it's not spreading anymore because there's too many immune people. But it's still around, and the fact that it can also be transmitted sexually is a completely new concept for the kind of flaviviruses that, and arboviruses that we're used to dealing with. So it means that it's probably going to continue some kind of transmission. And the fact that it has this terrible congenital defects associated with it, it, has, has kind of, it really keeps it on the map, shall we say. And so what I'm going to tell you about now is that kind of other level of kind of the other lens we can bring to what does migration mean. And what I'd like to tell you about are different methodologies that have been used to understand the sequence of this virus. And by understanding the sequence, understand how the mutations that arise have affected the function. Okay? So DNA sequencing, this is our double helix. And so what essentially what one does when one looks at an RNA virus is one has to take that single strand of RNA and move it back into DNA because the way we sequence is often from DNA. So we take the RNA, we make it back into DNA by making a, essentially a sister um, strand that will copy faithfully from the RNA. And then we make a library preparation with fragments. This is all this kind of technical stuff that, I, that I'm not going to bring you through. But essentially what the, what the concept is is that the new ways of sequencing, um, instead of only getting a sense of the entire population of, of, of um, viruses or sequences that are in, in the, what you're – obviously you can't see every single strand, right? It's too small. But what you could do is you can put a bunch of these things together until you get enough that you can actually start seeing. And with the, but the thing is that what's cool about the new sequencing technologies is that it, it enables you to look at, every, at the sequence of every DNA strand in your population. Um, you can then squish those all together and get what's called a consensus sequence. But you also can keep them individual and get a sense of what the cloud, if you wish, the cloud, the population of, of viruses has in, that, in, in the single uh, sample that you're looking at. And so what you can then do is you can then align the, either at, at the consensus level from different samples or even within a single sample. And you know that we have adenine, threonine, guanine, and uh, cytosine, and these are the bases that make up the DNA and then we, and, or and the RNA, and we can essentially align them to see where you have a particular mutation. And so in here, everybody's got a C or a cytidine except, um, except for this guy who's suddenly got a T. And so that is going to 
show us that there's, and then what this is going to do is change the amino acid, which is encoded by every triplet of, of essentially nucleic acids, will code for a single amino acid. And if you get this um, in a particular place, you will then change the amino acid, which will then change the protein. And so that's how this idea of the genetic code works. Um, and so what happens is that we can look at this spread, which I just showed you this map, um, but what we can do is then look at this spread phylogenetically. And so what you're seeing here is um, instead of seeing that the virus has gone here, what you're seeing is the sequence of that virus. And remember how I showed you that the distance, we measure it along this, this axis here. So these are very closely related. These are a little further related, a little further related, a little further related. But we can actually track the individual mutations that are responsible for those shifts. Okay, and I'm going to talk about two of those mutations particularly because they have specific functional consequences. And so one of them is in what's called the PRM protein, and the other is in my famous NS1 protein, which I started telling you about. Um, and what they do is you can map them in time as to when they happen. So this mutation happened between the movement from Asia into the South America, essentially. And so this is directly associated in time with the emergence of this new epidemic strain this new pathogenic strain as well. And another one happened over here, which was right when it moved into the French Polynesia and into the Pacific Islands, which is actually where it was also first associated with, with Guillain-Barre syndrome and with, with microcephaly. And so, one of the, so this is just a couple papers that have come out, not from my lab, but from the, the literature, which have shown that that single mutation that I showed you, that serine 139 um, to asparagine, it actually, this is, this is looking in, in mice, actually doing a, an experiment, and you can see that this is the percent survival of the mice that have been infected with different strains. And when they have this one mutation, you can see that the mice, this is over time, this is 100% survival, and then as the mice succumb, it goes down. And you can see that this, the, the, what essentially they've done is introduced a single mutation, and that one change is enough to cause this mortality in the mice. Um, and, and you can see that th th they can do it backwards. They can take a Venezuelan strain, m change the mutation around to what it was previously, and you lose the mortality. And so this shows very specifically that that mutation that arose over time can actually be functionally linked with more pathogenesis. And what's really interesting is that that other, that NS1 mutation, which is an alanine at this 118 position to a valine, which are actually very closely related amino acids, um, actually interfere with the signaling in what's called the interferon pathway. So um, when a virus infects a person, we have an immune response. And you've obviously heard of antibodies. The antibodies come up later, and they're called the adaptive immune response. But your the immediate response to a virus is to throw certain what we call innate immune response molecules right at it. And interferons are one of the really critical pathways. And so what viruses have adapted to do is to push back and to block different parts of the interferon pathway because the interferon pathway is trying to kill the virus. And so it's this, it, this you know, that tug of war, that evolutionary arms race between the virus and the immune system. So the immune system is set up to kill the virus and the virus pushes back. And this mutation right here actually can push back on this whole set of proteins which are part of the interferon response. And this particular mutation is the one that arose right when it moved from Africa into French Polynesia and then the Americas. So th essentially, not only did, is there a mutation that makes it more pathogenic, there's a mutation that actually pushes back on the ability of the host the immune response to control the virus. And then that same mutation, it's really interesting, actually enhances infectivity in the mosquito. So it's amazing. This one mutation both has a way of, of interfering with the infection or the response in humans, but it can also cause higher infectivity. So this is, the black is a strain that is from the Americas, and the red is a strain that is from Asia, and this is the a mosquito infection ratio, and they found out that the one, that the, the American mosquito, um, American strains have a higher infectivity in mosquitoes, and they were able to identify it right back to that same amino acid that I just talked about, where you put, you take a strain that doesn't have it, you add that one amino acid change, and you get higher uh, NS1, and you get higher replication in the mosquito. So it's really interesting. So in a very short time, you know, I mean, the, we're only, it started in 2016, essentially, and it's oh, just January, February 2018, and we already know how that has spread, what the genetic sequences are, and functionally, what are the mutations that are being involved in that spread, although it's not only about a new strain. So I just told you one of the questions here. It's the, it is a new virus, but there's also a new immune background, which is dengue immunity, and we can talk, I will not talk here, but there's a whole concept of 
how could dengue immunity either protect or enhance Zika? And that's a big part of what my lab does. Um, there's new hosts with different host genetics in the Americas. But there's also a numbers game where you just, instead of having you know, one island infected, we have millions of people. So you could have microcephaly, which is actually a rare event in humans, just by sheer numbers, poke its head over, so you can now start seeing them just because of the numbers that were infected. And that definitely also is playing a game. But there's also other factors, um, comorbidities, and then non, like non-directly medical or scientific aspects, which are socioeconomic status, access and legality of abortion, which is very different across the Americas, uh, family planning, delaying pregnancies, which happened. And so there's a lot of things which are not just pure science, which are happening. Um, political sensitivities, there's, and I know from personal experience, there's many countries which are not reporting the microcephaly cases that are happening. And so that will make it look different than it really is. Um, and environmental risk factors as well. So just to look at one of these, I'm going to bring in the migration by upward migration or social mobility. And what you can see here is a really interesting study in northeastern Brazil, which was kind of the epidemic kind of focus. Um, they've looked at different socioeconomic levels. And level one, which is over here in white, has very few cases. But the poorer areas are where all the cases are. And it goes from essentially microcephaly 12 per 10,000 per 10, to 68 per 10,000 when you get into poorer areas. And I think we're seeing the same thing in Nicaragua. We are in the middle of a, of a study to look at that as well. And there's many reasons. Could be access to termination, could be nutritional thing. There's a lot of stuff. So there's still those zillion Zika questions. Although we are advancing, there's still a lot out there. And what is really interesting is the multidisciplinary aspect that's necessary to be able to address all of these different aspects to really understand this disease. So that was kind of my first piece, which was talking about the migration across continents, but then kind of taking it down to a molecular level, um, as well as trying to understand the different aspects in a multidisciplinary way that, that affect this disease um, transmission and its change in severity. Um, so now we're going to talk about that second piece, which is about um, around cities. And what the examples that I'm going to give you, as I mentioned, are how they actually spread in our own populations the way we've measured them. So, um, the way we work is uh, one of our studies is called this cohort study, and it's really, really cool because you, you essentially enroll children in a particular year. This was in, 20, in 2004, and you follow healthy children through their life, um, and you provide medical care. So they come in and they, for all kinds of different at things that happen to them, but we're particularly interested in febrile illnesses. Um, but then wh what one does is that they, they actually donate uh, or contribute uh, every year a healthy blood sample which we then use to look at for anemia and for other things that have a direct medical benefit to them. But there's a great scientific value to that because what you can do is, is track whether someone has an infection because you can look at the amount of antibodies that the person raises. And if they have a rise in antibody, it means that they were infected, whether or not they got sick. And what we can do is we can look at all of those that are infected and then those that get sick. And we can look at what did they have prior in a previous sample that can protect or can put them at risk. And we've just done a lot of work um, looking at that and have been able to prove that, for instance, a l both certain kinds of antibodies will protect against dengue and other antibodies can give you more severe dengue. And we're able to dissect that out using this kind of a system. Um, anyways, but what we can do is that we have a lot of information because we also know who's had repeat infections and we can know over time when particular infections happen. Um, and what's really interesting is that we can use this as very clean data to see what epidemics look like in a given population because we're following these children with such intensity. And what you can see is from 2004 to 2017, these are the, uh, this is the number of cases, and this is dengue one. Remember I told you that there are these four flavors. We have three of them in Nicaragua, dengue one, two, and three. And so you can see that every epidemic in here is dengue one, and now we see our dengue two epidemics, and this is our dengue three epidemic. So what you see is that it's what's interesting in Nicaragua, some places in Asia have all four going at the same time. But in Nicaragua, we tend to see these waves where each one is really dominated by a different serotype, which allows us to do some really interesting virology and epidemiology and immunology. But what you can see here is that when we had, if you put all of these together, um, you can see that every year or so you have dengue. But then we had chikungunya, which came in using the same mosquito vector and was a huge epidemic. And then we had Zika, which I mean was literally vertical. I mean, we had this incredible epidemic in the space of two and a half months, essentially. And I'll show you the impact of that. So first of all, let's look at what these diseases actually look like in our population. So this is a piece of Managua. Managua is the capital of Nicaragua. Nicaragua is in Central America. 
And, the, and Managua has 1.4 million people, and this has one district within Managua near the lake. Um, and within that district is where we work, okay? So this is where we're looking at. Um, and this is all, so what we do is that all of those children, those 3,700 children, um, we GPS tag their home, which means that we know by geographical satellite um, where exactly the home is, and then we can map it, and then we can see who's getting infected with what. And, and, and so this is where every child lives. That's what each dot is, is where each of those children live. Um, and then this is um, a, essentially a video which tells us um, the spread of dengue from 2004 to 2010. And that each stereotype is going to be in a different color. So first of all, we're going to go, this makes me sick, so I'm going to watch you while you get vertigo. Um, so we're going to go down through Google Maps into Managua, like I said, and this is our study population. And what you're going to see here is in 2004, we had dengue 1, and then this is our seasons, and then we had kind of a mix of dengue 1 and 2. And then this is a, every, every season it happens when the mosquitoes are up. Then dengue 2 starts going away. And, we, uh, and then we have like a kind of larger dengue 2. So you went from dengue 1 to dengue 2. And now we're going to have a few cases of dengue 3 creeping in in blue. And then we had this really big dengue 3 epidemic. Um, and then that started to die out. As you can see, we had another one. And then so what you see here is kind of the way, it, first of all, you can see that there's a temporal pattern because it goes with the rainy season, which is when the mosquito is there. You can see that you have you know, these differential patterns of dengue one, dengue two, and you see often that it starts little, then you have a big wave, and then your population becomes immune to that stereotype, and you, have to, and you only can get an epidemic when you get a different introduction. And that introduction will be somebody went to visit their tia, their aunt in Costa Rica, or they went, and so, so that's what that kind of global trade and travel is what's intro reintroducing into a, by then susceptible population, a new dengue stereotype. So we just did the same thing, actually, for this particular lecture. Um, one of my wonderful graduate students, Fausto Busto, helped me to put this together. And what this is showing you is Zika. So remember, that other one was about six or eight years. This is just one year. And so we're looking now, this is by now, it's the beginning of June, we're coming in. This is July, this is August, this is September, and it's gone. So it was all within literally two and a half to three months. Um, and it was really intense. And so then, so then what happens is we need to find out why this is repeating is number one. Um, and then, so, so the, quish, the issue was that's the number of cases that we detected. But you can imagine with that amount of cases, how, what, what did the rest of the population, like what, how, how many people were infected? So the, the, clef, the thing about Zika is that it's not very severe. So we don't know how many people are actually coming to the health center. I mean, these are only the people who came to the health center. There's a whole other bunch that were asymptomatic or had, had rash and never came to the health center. But we really need to know how many people were infected because how many people are infected is going to tell us whether we're going to have another epidemic. And so the whole region, and certainly the Ministry of Health, needs to know whether they're expecting another epidemic or whether there's enough immunity in the population that you know, we're probably going to get some cases, but not another big epidemic. And so this is what's so important. But there were no tools, because everything we've always used, which are the ability to measure antibodies, was screwed up, excuse my language, because it crossed with dengue. So there were no tools to distinguish dengue antibodies from Zika antibodies. But because you know, I work in the field and I have a lot of friends, <laughs> I got some um, antibodies which are very specific to Zika. Um, and, we, and in collaboration with a, with a group in, in um, Switzerland, put together what's called an ELISA technique, which I'm not going to bring you through in, in excruciating detail, but just to tell you that essentially you can take um, antibodies in your serum will recognize the, the protein. So if I was infected with Zika, um, I will recognize Zika NS1 protein in this case. But a person with dengue will also recognize that because of the cross-reactivity. But if I come in with a very specific antibody that's to Zika, I will push off anything that's dengue that's not specific enough. And I can use that kind of additional specificity to distinguish who has Zika and who has dengue. Because if I've had Zika, then I'm going to be, my antibodies are going to be sticking on that NS1 protein and it's just not going to be pushed off. But if I had dengue and the affinity is not so great, then I'll just walk off. And that will essentially change the color of the enzyme-linked assay. And so that's just the way it works. So we can kind of use a trick 
to make it more specific, where otherwise you couldn't tell the difference. And so we were able to put that together and very quickly set it up in five different countries and actually come up with a test that was very sensitive. It's like 20, 92 to 95 percent sensitive um, against a known infection that was PCR, essentially that was a virally confirmed infection, and very specific which was the really important thing. So you want something to be sensitive to capture, but you also want it to be specific and only look at, at Zika. And that's what we were able to set up. So that took a while, but then once we had that, we could then take it back out into our population and ask the question, not only how many cases were sick, but how many people were infected. And we can do that by looking at antibodies using the specific methodology. So are you following that? So first we need to have the methodology to be able to look at who is specific. And what we found is that this is um, the percentage here on the y-axis and the age on the x-axis. And we see that we get this increase from even at two years old, we already have 20% of the children have been infected up to essentially the, in adults, we have 56% infection. And so we have in, in our cohort of 3,700 kids, in that two and a half month period, 36% of the children were infected and 56% of the adults were infected. So overall, essentially 46, 50% in three months were infected. Now, that's kind of crazy, but the good part of it is that that's so much that you probably are not gonna get the same kind of an epidemic that you, you had before, because I think part of the issue with Latin America and Zika is that you had a totally susceptible population, whereas now the population has immunity. So we are definitely seeing much, much less, actually zero Zika, um, in the aftermath of this. Um, but then we were also able to map it spatially because we know, remember how all those little points were there? We know where everyone lives and so we can map their seropositivity against where they live and we, and we did this using colors. And so you can see that this is darker purple and then less purple and then lighter purple. So the most of the infections were in this region and we were like, well, what's this? So can anyone guess what that is? It's the cemetery, right? So why would the cemetery be a risk factor? Because you bring flowers in water, and it's clean water, and no one is actually paying attention every day to cleaning up the water. So when you have a barrel of water, or you're a pila, which is where you wash dishes, you're washing dishes every day, right? So you have water in your home, but you're moving it around every day. And the, the mosquito, I didn't show you the life cycle, but essentially there's, there's eggs, and the eggs need water to eclose, and then it takes about Five, three days to become um, a larva, and then it becomes a pupa, and another three or four days, and then eventually will become the mosquito. So it takes a full week or eight days for the mosquito to come out of the egg. Um, and so if you are cortando las, el ciclo de vida, as we say, cutting the life cycle every eight days or every week, you can actually stop transmission. So, it, but and so in your house you have water, but if you're always like using that water or getting rid of it because that's, you've, been, you've learned that that's the way to prevent Zika and Dengue, then you can break the, light, the cycle because you're getting rid of where the mosquitoes are breeding. But in the cemetery, no one's actually coming and cleaning out all of those water jars with the flowers, you know, or you know, the tombs where there's the broken something and it's cold. And so that turns out, so we, we actually went back a year later and went and did um, a, a whole survey of entomology. So we actually collected the larva and the mosquito, et cetera, in the cemetery, et cetera, to map where there were these risk factors. And of course, we're in communication with the ministries of health so that they know where they need to target their next mosquito um, campaigns. Um, but what was interesting is that, that Fausto Busto, the same one who had done the spatial map for me, um, did another kind of a much more uh, fancy approach uh, to modeling where the, where the um, infections are happening. And he found that this is where, you know, we have this high risk, and, um, but actually there's another place here, and so we didn't know why this other place was, was actually kind of coming up on his map. So we looked at the map, and there's, a, there's different barrios, as you saw, there's different, there's different neighborhoods, and this is in, in Julio Buitrago barrio, or neighborhood, and we said, okay, so when we sent a team to actually look what's there, and it turns out that there's this big tire selling shop right here. Um, and, the, and, and this is what it looks like. So this is a shop, and this is like, and so we, there's this thing called vulcanization or, or vulcanization, I, which I didn't know existed in English, but apparently it does. But essentially it's where in Nicaragua you bring your tires that blow up in your car, and then you stick a piece of, patch, like a rubber patch on it, and then you go back um, for three weeks until it happens again. Um, but this is a problem, right? Because a tire, you, if it's like this, you're gonna have water here, right? Okay, well let's not put it like this. Let's go like this. Well, but then you're gonna have water here. 
you know, and then you say, well, let's flip it over, but then, you know, you're going to have water here. So there's, it's really a problem. But what's really cool is that in our evidence-based um, community, essentially community-derived interventions, when you explain that, what they did essentially is that the, 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 the barrios themselves, all the people, had all these amazing solutions. So what they did is that they would fill the tires with earth, and they would make staircases. Because a lot of the times there was just kind of mud, like mud slopes, and it's very useful to have staircases. But cleverly, if you take, you don't throw out your tire, but you fill it with earth. So there's no way that you can have water there. But in like decades of you know WHO and CDC Atlanta thinking about how can we control the mosquito, no one had occur it just had not occurred to anyone that you could use the tires. And that's one of the biggest issues when you go in and you say that's junk, get rid of your junk. It's really offensive to the population. That if you say, this is the problem, you know, this is the mosquito life cycle, and it's breeding here, do you have any solutions? They're like, yeah. You know, so then, and you can make planters. So you fill it with dirt, and you plant, you know, plant yerba buena, chintoma, you know, there's all kinds of things. They build bridges, and then they're not getting rid of their own property. They're just understanding the, the problem. And so it's really brilliant. So we still got to deal with these, pe these people. And so, then, and, and, and so then we have, like, communities working with the different um, pro um, proprietors of, of those shops to figure out how, how we can, you know, deal with these issues. Um, so that was kind of one thing. So that was kind of a, a story to tell you about, now let's go from the continent level into the level of the city. Um, and then, you know, kind of what can we pull out using our studies at a kind of much more m m micro level, if you wish. Well, not micro. Um, middle E level, <laughs> because now we're going to go micro. Um, now we're going to go inside the human host in the end of my, the last piece of my talk. And so what I'm going to show you is now we're going to look at the migration of these viruses inside the human. So the first thing I'm going to tell you about is work that we've been doing in collaboration with a laboratory at the University of California, San Francisco. Um, and this is a woman, Lenore Pereira, who works on cytomegalovirus, and which is a big problem in terms of vertical transmission into the baby. And so she's an expert on looking at human placenta. Um, and you can actually get explants um, for, from essentially miscarriages or terminations or what have you at the, at the hospital, which are just essentially thrown out, um, and then use those to understand what is the capacity of Zika virus to be able to infect different placental cells. Because the big question is the placenta is supposed to protect the baby. So why is this Zika virus able to get into the placenta? So we have a lot of work around that area, which I'm not going to go into, but I'll, just, but I'll just show you a little bit of the work, which was essentially looking at um, this two different aspects. One is the chorionic membrane, which is around the placenta, and the other is the, this villi, the chorionic villi, um, which is how the placenta goes and actually attaches to the uterine wall to hold on. So this is what's called invasion process, um, which then makes the baby able to connect with the mother. Um, and what you can do is, is, is these are actually, you can look at this explants in a dish, again, of this discarded tissue, um, and, and, and they're actually these little chorionic villi, and you can actually look directly, and, and what's nice about it is it's a mix of cells. So you're not just having like just a cell line in a dish that's completely disconnected. It's actually part of discarded human tissue. Um, and what we could do here is using this immunofluorescence microscopy is identify in situ, you can see by these different colors, we can identify what the cell is using an antibody that, that, that tells you what, this, what essentially a surface marker for the cell in red, and in green are antibodies to Zika protein. Um, and, it, and some of them are actually antibodies, the green ones show you here, um, when it's the E protein, it just shows you that the virus is here, but when it's called the NS1 protein, that protein only happens when the virus is replicating because it's, it's actually a non-structural protein, so it's not in the virion, it's in the genome. And it's only going to be translated when that virus has infected and is replicating in another cell. So we can tell that this is not only present, but it's actually replicating virus. And you can see this is a cytotropoblast, which are actually over here in this kind of chorionic villus, which is doing the invasion. And then we also found, really importantly, that these, there's cells inside the, the villus core, which are called Hoffauer cells, and those are fetal macrophages. And that's really important because the macrophage is the favorite target of Zika and dengue, and it's actually where that enhancement phenomenon can happen. Um, and so the, we know already that the virus can, in, can actually infect these cells, and it can actually go into these fetal uh, macrophages, and is actually migrating, if you wish, through the placenta. Um, we also show physical migration in the Nicaraguan strains actually are able to infect cells and then migrate with those cells as they do the invasion of the uterine wall, but 
the African strains, at least the ones that have been looked at um, in, in laboratories, are, do not have that capacity. So there's also something different about the new viruses that are emerging in the Americas. Um, and so what we were able to do by doing these ex experiments directly in explants and in a bunch of different um, cells that come from different parts of the, um, of the placenta and of the, the uterine, the, the placental membrane, we were able to con recon essentially construct a path like a logical path for how the virus is getting into the placenta. And what was really interesting is that there was, everyone was thinking that it was coming in through these kind of the virion, the, vil, the, the villus, but it actually, we found that there was a lot of, of infection of the amniotic epithelial cells. And what we came up with was this concept of two different routes into the placenta. That it was migrating not only through this one route, which is what everyone was thinking about, but potentially also through the amniotic membranes. And so then, and that's something that we can then test as uh, different specimens become available. And it also allowed us to identify drugs um, that could actually, uh, this is a proof of concept because it was an antibiotic that exists for animal use, but conceptually, by identifying the receptors and how you would block them, we were able to identify what antivirals could be useful in blocking, um, the, you know, potentially the, the, this migration or the infection of Zika into the placenta. So that's one very kind of literal imagery of migration. But the other one, I want to just go back for a moment into the kind of genetic concept. Um, and what I'm going to end with are two stories, um, one about dengue and then a very little a coda about Zika, using this concept of the actual individual mutations that arise in RNA viruses. So remember I told you that RNA viruses are prone to more mutations than DNA viruses because they don't have that other template to hold down the mutation rate. But so that every time you have a virus, you don't have a single virus that all is the same. You actually have a cloud of virions. And that cloud will allow certain mutations to arise. Um, and then it's up to like essentially a, a, the host, whether it's gonna survive and grow or whether it's gonna be pushed back or how does that work? And so this was an interesting study because what we essentially the idea is that you can take this virion and these are just literally peaks that tell you how much cytosine and uh, C and T and G and et cetera is. And when you have a mixed peak, then that means that there's actually several things going on at that single site. And you can actually reconstruct the amount of what's called intra-host genetic diversity. So we're talking about in a single person, you have a cloud, you have different virions, different viruses, different RNAs going on. Um, and we can, we can quantitate that and learn from it. So we wanted, so this was a study in dengue where we had a bunch of, 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 of children and we had, of course, the, you know, they're in the hospital, so they're just giving, their blood is taken for clinical reasons. And so we just take that blood and use it for scientific investigation. But you're only gonna have venous blood, right, because that's what's being taken. You're not gonna like, take a biopsy of some kid who's in for dengue who doesn't need it. So all we can work with is the blood and the blood cells. So we have serum and we have what we call peripheral blood mononuclear cells or white blood cells. And what we were interested in is what does it look like when you have, you know, how much of the dengue is inside the white blood cells in terms of replicating and how much is coming out into, into the bloodstream and what's the relation between the virus that's in the cell and the virus that's outside the cell. Um, and so what we did is we looked at, we compared the intrahost diversity and then we looked to see if there were hotspots of mutation, which no one had ever looked at because what you, what you think of dengue and Zika as like a really quick virus and you don't think that anything's going on. You think of HIV or hepatitis C and these are really long, many years and so you get all this time for mutations to go on. And no one thinks that in a one week you can get a lot of mutation and in fact you can. So this is really interesting. So what we did is that we, we did this intra-host sequencing with, where you look at every single virion and every RNA, vi RNA over the entire genome. This, remember I showed you that this is the RNA genome. And then you look for the differences you know, among each cloud. And what was really interesting, so remember how I showed you that there's a virion and it's got that envelope protein which is on the outside? So now we're taking just that envelope protein and we're mapping in red the different mutations or the variations that there are inside the white blood cell. And then we're looking at in the plasma, which is outside in the, in the blood, and what are the, the mutations there? And then what are the ones that are in both? And what you see is that there's very, very little green, right? Which means that there's, the mutations are completely different from inside the cell and outside the cell, which means that those viruses inside the cells are not the ones that are populating your bloodstream, okay? Now, we kind of knew this from early work in like, you know, 
in, in animal models that there's other sources of virus, but the, the whole field is so used to only working with blood from, you know, venous blood that we just assume, oh yeah, it's infecting the macrophages and that's where all of the virus is coming from. But they're completely different viruses. So what's popular, essentially the virus that's, that is in our bloodstream must be coming from somewhere else in our body. And it's probably coming from the splenic macrophages or somewhere else. But this is really interesting because it tells us that kind of our assumptions going into it are wrong. Um, and, but, that are the, but looking at the genetics, we can understand that there's other sources of virus in the body. And the other thing we can see is that this is a first dengue infection and this is a second dengue infection. And when we quantitate the number of, of variable, um, essentially variations or mutations, you can see visually and you can see much more when you quantitate it that there's less when you're having a second dengue infection. And what that implies is that the, that the antibodies are actually exerting a pressure on the mutation rate and essentially keeping it down in a second infection. Um, and, and, and this is actually shows you that, that there's mutations happening in real time only in that one week, which is so this like just a single investigation can tell you that. The other thing that was really interesting is that we found these hotspots where these are along that entire genome, this is where all the mutations were happening. And, just, and, and what's even more interesting is that they were different. This one was the same in the white blood cells and in the serum, and this was completely different. So again, these are not the same viruses. It's not the same source. Um, and, but it also tells you that you can get these, these hotspots right away. And, and this is a little bit of a complicated slide, but the conception here is that each of these um, viruses actually has a different source, and yet they all are coming up with the same mutations. And, and that proves that this is a new mutation that's arising de novo in all of those different people. So 80% of the patients all had these hotspot mutations, um, but they were from different vi viruses. Like the viruses were all different, and yet they all were arising with the same mutation all within the week that that person had been infected. So it completely changes our way of thinking about how this works because we used to think that you needed months and years for this to happen, but you can capture that happening in a very quick way. Um, and so, and what's really interesting is that the place, that, that hotspot that I showed you, that one hotspot that is in the E protein, is in a place that actually hurts replication. Um, and we showed in the lab that the viruses that had those mutations were, were essentially poorer in replicating. So then why is this mutation arising? Well, it turns out that it's, in a, it's actually in a place that can escape the antibody response. So it's, it's, you're having this battle between something which is not good for your replication, but that you can escape an antibody. And so that's like your evolutionary battle which is going on. And we can see it inside a single person over and over again, which is really interesting. So essentially what we can see is that you have this rapid evolution and the first reports of these hotspots um, and this idea that it's convergent, meaning that all these different viruses are all coming up with the same one, but that it's being restricted because it's essentially a battle between the replication on the one hand and the antibody escape on the other. And so that's, so that's essentially the idea of different migration of mutations inside the human body and what are the pressures that are happening for those mutations to either stick or not stick in the genome. So that's the thing. And then the last piece is just, I don't have data for this, but this I think is a cool study that we, we actually just got the data this week, but it was too complicated even for me to understand, so I figured I wouldn't, I wouldn't throw it at you. But what we did is we wanted to look at, so that was a study on dengue, but of course now we're interested in looking at Zika. And one of the, the issues with Zika is that um, it, it, it's in the bloodstream for a little bit of time, but it's in the urine for longer, and it's also in the saliva. And so it's actually in all these different bodily fluids. And we never really thought to look for dengue elsewhere than the blood. But because there was this whole issue, and also with the longevity, we, uh, there's, we know that, by, that now Zika is in different bodily fluids. So the question is, how much is in different bodily fluids and how much is it changing in these different bodily fluids? And so j the idea was to simply take this, this so we have um, a study where, as I told you, we're now back. Remember how I told you about our cohort study and the children come in sick? So they come in sick and we immediately can detect that they have Zika because we can do it very quickly using molecular methods. So we enrolled 33 children who had Zika and, we, and then we go to their homes and we ask them if we can enroll people in their households because we want to see how is that one person spreading it to their household. And so we, we were able to enroll the 109 household members and we came on, on, on day one, day three, day six, day nine, and then day 21. So we had this really interesting study where we have samples across time, very short time periods. 
Um, and so what we were able to do is to map the amount of the, of the RNA, this is looking at RNA, so which is representative of the Zika virus, over days in different bodily fluids. So you can see that the serum, which is what most people sample, it crashes after four days. So you can't, even someone is infected, if they come in a little bit later, you don't see the infection anymore unless you have an antibody method, right? Um, and the saliva, you can see there's a lot of virus in the saliva, and you can actually detect it for longer. And the urine, you can detect it for much longer. Um, so this is really important for understanding what would be a good diagnostic specimen, number one. But it's also interesting because we can look at in this intra-host idea about what is the migration of mutations over time, um, we have all these different samples. So we can ask, in a single person, how much variation is there using that technique where we can actually look at each of those RNAs in a cloud. And we can also look at, in a single bodily compartment, how does it change over time. So we, we actually are able, you know, just from the extra blood that we collect, you know, from the clinical visits, et cetera, and we're collaborating with a group in Singapore, um, October Sessions, and he actually got the first set of data, which I don't understand. So <laughs> it's going to be very, very interesting, but I just can't tell you anything about it yet. Um, but I think it's going to be, it's really nice. So the idea was that what we tried to do in the face of this incredibly fast epidemic was kind of, you know, immediately respond and try and answer as many questions as we can across the board. Um, and so as I, what I tried to show you here in conclusion is this concept of migration, of disease migration, of viral migration um, at these very different levels. And we reviewed what does it look like when dengue spreads and especially when Zika spreads across the continent, across the world, and what is driving that spread. And we figured, found that there are many different issues, one of which has to do potentially with a new virus where there's some really interesting evolution that's coming on through adaptation and natural selection, um, you know, that we actually have functional evidence for what that virus mutation does. Then we went to another level, which was the cities, um, and here we could visually see the differences in how the serotypes of dengue move in a single population of our cohort, um, and how incredibly fast that happened with Zika, um, and then how we developed tools to look not only at the, the cases, but then at the effect on the entire population, and then use that to identify spatial risk factors, um, and we're also looking at additional risk factors um, for for being able to both uh, understand it and then ideally control it. For instance, we know that the cemetery is a problem now, so something can actually be done about that by public health authorities. Um, and then we went more to the human host and looked how physically does the Zika migrate into the placenta and what are different routes that that migration can take. Um, and then also, what about you know, this kind of concept of using the genetic migration and understanding how we can see that, that in a very short amount of time, we actually can still get these mutations inside viruses that tell us where are the sources of the virus in the body and also how is, is evolution happening at this very rapid pace um, around the natural selection and, and the barriers to fitness. Um, and then finally, this cool study which we just started, and the next time you invite me here, I'll tell you all about it. Um, so, as an conclu overall conclusion, um, the way I kind of see science is kind of a continual migration um, of evidence-based theories and ideas to explain phenomena in the world. You know, so you see something, you collect information, you come up with hypotheses, you test them, some are right, some are wrong, you know, and that gives you new ideas, you test those ideas, you move, and you kind of migrate those ideas across time and space in the scientific realm, because that's how science moves. Um, and it takes many, many people. And so this final quote, which is attributed to Charles Darwin, is in the long history of humankind and animal kind too, those who learn to collaborate and improvise most effectively have prevailed. And so I think this is really an important concept because I think that on the collaboration is critical on so, so many levels. So one is, I, um, I kind of see it as a collaboration of disciplines. As you can see, I, you know, I, my particular research program crosses many disciplines partly of an inability to focus, but um, also because I do believe that all, everything's interesting, but really, you know, to approach a, a, a disease and to really understand it, it's not about one protein and it's not about one aspect. It's really about that holistic approach. And having that in place makes you able to pivot much more rapidly when there's another emerging threat. And the example was kind of moving from dengue to Zika, but also just having that conception of a broader kind of renaissance view of science. You know, as the way science has migrated these days is into publish, 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 and you know, there's so much pressure and so much to do that people end up being in silos. And I think that that's a very dangerous approach and that really to make science you know, migrate the best and most effective and most powerful way possible, it's really across disciplines. 
But it's also across people, and it's across people who are scientists. And it's, you know, again, that idea of collaborative science. I have many, many collaborations, some of which I'll put in my slides, but you know, the, the, it just, it's very exciting and fun to work with people um, across disciplines, and really as a collaborative effort, it's kind of the only way you move things forward, um, both in the scientific realm and also, of course, um, collaborations, for instance, with Nicaragua, which has been a really huge part of my life, um, and has given it so much meaning, because what's so wonderful about that is that you advance science, but you also make a difference in public health and in people's lives, and you can actually see it in real time. And I think that that's, you know, and, 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 and not just the impact that you have in that moment, but you're building infrastructure and you're training people so that they can handle their own problems in their own situation locally. And I think that that's a really important point. And you know, both do it locally, but then that spreads back out to the international community because we learn so much from that process. Um, and it's a lot of fun. Um, so that's my talk. And I want to thank the people in my laboratory at Berkeley who are involved in the they're in the pathogenesis group and also the immunology, and especially Fausto Busto, who's a wonderful PhD student who, um, when I realized what this talk really meant and that I actually had to write something up about it after, I immediately grabbed him, um, and he's been wonderful and kind of you know, bouncing ideas and actually making the movies, and, and I presented his spatial work, which is part of his PhD uh, dissertation. Um, and then this is only some of the people that, that are part of our wonderful team in Nicaragua, where we have about 200 people who support these projects in the Laboratorio Nacional de Virología, which is in the Ministry of Health, um, in, our, in our health centers, the Centro de Salud Socrates Flores Vivas, and then our um, hospital, La Mascota, and our, our SSI, our nonprofit, which is also based in Nicaragua, with a lot of support um, from the Ministry of Health, as well as from folks in my, uh, my laboratory and my group, and especially Dr. Josefina Coloma and Aubrey Gordon. Um, and of course, the children who are really what make this all happen, and their families, and the funding. And then you for putting up with me for a whole hour. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much. You, you Professor Harris, you described us at the outset as your guinea pigs, and you've left your guinea pigs well-fed, well-informed, and inspired. And I also want to pick up another thing uh, that's recurred in your, your talk, and that was the importance you put on engaging uh, developing companies' communities, not just in the consumption of science, but in, in its production. And I know from your publications that was just the tip of a very important iceberg. And I think it's quite important, either in Cambridge or in Berkeley, we're very used to uh, uh, addressing problems and finding solutions through world-class equipment and kit. And it's been a very important part of your work, which is shown in this slide and the announcement and acknowledgements, that, um, that, that uh, communities who could never imagine having the facilities that we have are involved in the production of science and not just its consumption. So thank you very much for that. Next week we have. Uh, I have to remind myself of. Uh, <laughs> next week we have Kavita Puri, who will speak on the partition of India and migration. But before we go, can I ask you once again to put your hands together and thank Professor Harris for her excellent lecture. <laughs>